Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs and for Emily Chang, U.S. stocks bouncing back from a sharp sell-off but still closing at a two-week low as big tech shares like Amazon, Microsoft and Facebook all selling off. And we are awaiting a news conference from President Trump. We will bring you highlights from that, of course, as it happens. But first, let's get back to the markets. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle standing by. It's certainly still in the red, but at least a much better picture than the way it looked at 11 a.m. this morning. Indeed, Taylor. And what a roller coaster on the day and on the week. Because earlier this week, we, of course, had big gains for the likes of Apple and Tesla midweek. And then today, not so much, giving up some of those big gains. But to your point, finishing off the lows. Nonetheless, the worst week since June uh, for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 since March. But the NASDAQ 100 on the day down 1.3 percent, well off of its greater than 5 percent midday loss. So some of that selling pressure really came off. You see the New York Fang Index, which had been down even more, down 1% uh, at the end of the day. And some of this happened as uh, value money uh, seemed to give a little bit of a tailwind to the macro sentiment, plus Taylor, and that, ha that has to do with yields. Yields really backing up on the day as Haven bonds uh, were selling off, not confirming uh, the degree of the sell-off from a risk-off, fearful standpoint. I think what we really have going on here, Taylor, technical selling, the 50-day moving average for the NASDAQ 100, really looking for it in the morning, finding it when we go into this Bloomberg terminal. So a very solid test there. The question is going forward, will that 50-day moving average, will those near-term buyers continue to step up? If yes, we're probably going to have some choppy movement to the upside. If not, it could get really ugly really fast just because of how far, how fast these markets have come off of the March lows at NASDAQ 100 up more than 80 percent. And on the week you were talking about really brutal losses here, the New York Fang Index down sharply, Apple Tesla, all the worst weeks in, since March. However, we do have one bright spot, Taylor, because it's not all bad. I was mentioning <laughs> the cyclicals, but there's actually one bright spot amongst uh, the high flyers, and that is Zoom, up about 20%, if you can believe it, on that week, on that stellar quarter and raising guidance. So one of the high flyers is managing to hold on to gains. Next week is going to be very interesting. Volatility probably ahead, Taylor. Yeah, Abigail, and talk to me a little bit about that while I have you. Certainly within the NASDAQ 100, higher volatility, higher impact applied vol certain looking higher than the realized volatility so more volatility still to be expected. Yes, indeed. You know, if you look at the VIX curve, there isn't one on the NASDAQ 100, but the VIX curve for the S&P 500's VIX, it's certainly rising right into uh, the election. And it's worth noting the VIX out of 30 right now, that NASDAQ 100 VIX, where folks were really expecting big volatility, and we got it this week clearly for big tech, out of 42. For that VIX on the NAS on the S&P 500 going into October, November, December, we're looking at closer to 37. That suggests that there's a lot of uncertainty around the election and based on the action that we've seen this week the selling for tech stocks but bonds holding uh, you know not confirming it from the standpoint holding in quite frankly flat on the week the 10-year yield is literally flat on the week suggests to me that we're probably going to see lots of bumpy volatility ahead until some of the macro overhangs are removed. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle keeping us honest on all things tech and volatility. And for a closer look at those markets, for, uh, specifically those tech markets, I want to bring in Art Hogan, Chief Market Strategist at National Securities Corporation. Art, talk to me about the action in the last two days. A healthy pullback? Yeah, I think Abigail re actually wrapped things up pretty nicely in uh, in the last section of the, your report there. And, and you know, it's <clears throat> this is a, a September that follows one of the best August we've seen in years literally you know tens of years so we've got a market that went very far very fast coming into the week we had rsis or relative strength index on the s&p and the nasdaq in the 80s approaching 90 so clearly on any measurement we had a market that got stretched um, and, and was technically overbought so it didn't take much of a momentum shift to, to see this market roll over a bit and that sell-off came from the places where most profits were there to be taken so when you look at the Fabulous Five in the Facebook, Apple, Google, Microsoft, et cetera. And, and uh, when they start leaking out some valuations, it happens. And momentum works in both directions. I think that's healthy right now. And I think that the, I think Abigail set this up nicely when she said, looking forward, I think we have as many headwinds as we have tailwinds. So I think volatility probably becomes the norm until we get through the election cycle. 
So when we think about the U.S.-China technology cold war mm -hmm. that's starting right now and, and, and heating up every day, when we think about the fact that we're heading into an election cycle, I think that's important as well. The flip side of that is we still have aggressive monetary policy, and eventually we'll get some more fiscal policy out of uh, gridlock in Washington. So you've got a pretty balanced, uh, but a lot of catalysts that can cause some concern in September, historically, a tough month for markets. All right, I, I want to talk about the weighting of big tech relative to the rest of the market. There was some concerns coming into this that if you started to get a little bit of a rollover in some of those high fly names in Apple and in Tesla, it had the ability to bring down the rest of the market with it. Did you see that the minute we got a little cracks in some of those big names, everything else came down with it? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So you could actually have a healthy rotation out of the mega cap technology days into the economically sensitive sectors that have underperformed this rally since March 23rd, and yet see the S&P 500 itself go lower. And, and that only makes sense because you say to yourself, a market cap weighted index is going to be more impacted by the large cap, mega cap, trillion dollar market cap companies than they are going to be the, by any of the energy names, industrial names any of the financials, any of the materials names. So you could get a significant rebound in the underperformers and still see the S&P 500 lower mm -hmm. if there's enough of a, a move out of technology and into the economically sensitive cyclicals. I think that's probably a healthier place to be. So if we have to give up 50 or 100 S&P points but have a broader market with sponsorship of sectors that just haven't seen any buying this in, during the entire cycle, that's probably a healthy place to be. So I think that uh, I think that's logical to think that way, but it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game either. You can see sponsorship of all groups after a spell, but some of these tech names have just gotten ahead of themselves. Cash on the sidelines. I heard the minute we got a 5 or a 10% pullback, investors are desperate to deploy some of that cash. And you really saw that 11 a.m. today when we were off an additional 5%, that buying the dip opportunity. Is a buy the dip opportunity so prevalent that that can drive the market higher? I certainly think that's the case. And when you think about the longer term projections, right? So when you, when you say, let's put August behind us, and say that you're looking at this market and you say, is 2021 going to be better than 2020? Is it likely that the first and second quarter of next year are going to look better than the first and second quarter of this year? And if that's the case, should I take advantage of a better entry level into this market as we see what we normally see three times a year, a 5 to 10 percent drawdown? And I would say that's the case. I think there's a lot of reasons to think that there's going to be a lot of economic energy exploding into 2021 when we get a vaccine and a lot of pent-up demand for goods and services that were impossible to get in 2020 happen in 2021. So I think that uh, we're in a long-term bull market. Now, I also think that volatility is going to be the norm, not the exception, as we head into the end of the year and certainly through the election cycle. But I think these sell-offs, these, these average sell-offs that we typically have are opportunities to have a better entry level into what is a long-term cyclical bull market. Okay, talk to me about the cyclical bull market because a lot of has been made about these high-flying tech stocks and growth versus value. Today, though, we started to see a little bit of that rotation out of growth, out of tech, into value. Is that trade sustainable? I, it's certainly sustainable. But here's the issue, right? So since the lows of March 23rd, technology has done well, but technology in large part is agnostic to the economic growth we're going through. So when you think about a Zoom communications technology company that does well because we're stuck at home, and even though the economy is in, in bad shape, companies like Netflix doing well regardless of the fact that we can't go back to work or go to restaurants or go on cruises, Apple Computer, all of the names that have done well because of the environment that we're in or in spite of the environment in, will do well in a normalized economy, but they, they don't have a special appeal to them. When the economy starts to turn better, if the economically sensitive sectors, whether you want to call it these cyclicals or if you want to call it value, and they're both right now, will outperform because they are tied to an improving economy, an economy that's actually growing. Right now we have an economy that's in terrible shape that's getting less bad. As we turn a calendar to 2021 and we actually start seeing some economic growth, my guess is that is a rotation that's going to continue for a while. And at very discounted prices, when you think about the economically sensitive cyclicals and where they're trading right now, it probably provides a great opportunity. So we've been telling investors for a while to have a barbell approach. You want to have the mega cap technology healthcare names on one side of that, and on the other side you want to have the cyclicals. And that's going to get you through the next 12 to 18 months. So I think that rotation into um, the cyclicals is going to be a bumpy road. We saw a little bit in June 
and then it pulled back. We're seeing some now, and I bet this trend continues into the first quarter of next year. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Art Hogan, National Securities Corporation Chief Market Strategist. And coming up, we're going to take a further look at that jobs report from this morning, how one company is making the job hunt fun. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. Mark Cuban betting that AI can transform the hiring process, investing in startup Scoutable. We now go on over to Bloomberg's Shanali Basik, who's speaking with Scoutable CEO Angela Anthony. Shanali, take it away. Thank you, Taylor, and thank you, Angela, for joining us. You know, it's a really relevant day to have you with the jobs report out today, and I'm wondering what you believe the skills of the future are for the post-COVID workforce. What are employers telling you? Yeah, I mean, the answer to that question has become obvious, especially given the pace at which our workforce has been changing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the skills of the future is a fast moving goalpost. So to put some numbers around that, 52% of today's job tasks will disappear in the next five years, and nearly 60 million new jobs uh, will appear in the same time frame. So, you know, the kind of important thing to remember is that we all actually have these soft skills, or at Scoutable, we call them strengths, that make us naturally faster learners in roles that fit our strengths. Well, those um, so new jobs, can... I, do, I want to talk about those new jobs for a second. Let, let's hang on to that thought, because those new jobs, today we saw a lot of the jobs created with the government and in logistics and places you would see in this economy. But where do you see those 60 million new jobs coming from? I mean, it's really across the board. I mean, the thing is that technology is certainly changing the technology field, but it's applying to everything across the economy. So, you know, as I was saying, like the real skill of the future is the ability to identify the industries and roles that fit our strengths, which allow us to maintain a competitive advantage for upskilling for the demands of the rapidly evolving economy from all, all angles and across the board. I'm glad you started to bring up those, you know, so-called soft skills. A little earlier today, we spoke to the president of Arizona State, and he said the hardest thing in the hardest thing in the job market is uh, English or philosophy major that can code. What are the three skills? What are those soft skills that you could boil down to what employees are looking for? So it's really not. Um, there's no blanket skills that you know fit every job. It's really very unique to every single role as well as every single company. But across the board, research has shown that the soft skills or the strengths um, that people have are the single most accurate predictors of future job performance for any job. So you know it's really about finding the roles that fit your unique strengths. Um, and for companies, it's about finding the best benchmark for which sets of attributes uh, that fit the role and fit their company's culture. Um, because the set of strengths that work for a specific role and, and company can vary by department, it can vary by uh, team, seniority, by actual geographic location of the, of the company or the office. Um, so, having a technology that actually is able to identify which soft skills work the best for a, a certain role is really the key to unlocking the power of soft skills in the hiring process. So can you explain a little what this unconscious bias that you're tracking among employers is? What are employers getting wrong here? Yeah, so unconscious bias really is something that is, you know, not not really a, a you know denunciation of any individual or any individual's process. It's really something that is a you know kind of psychological phenomenon about how we as humans uh, evaluate and process information sequentially or you know at all. Um, so you know it's the the crazy thing about it is it's so obvious from the numbers that we see. Um, there's so many studies that show that whitening an applicant's name on a completely equivalent resume um, doubles the callbacks for interviews. Um, and actually people you know, think that we're learning soft skill information through, inter through interviews, um, where the research actually shows that the impression, like our, our evaluation interviews are made in the first 10 seconds, where in the first 10 seconds, the most salient information we glean are unfortunately things like gender and age, race and socioeconomic signals. So 
you know, and then on top of that, we have recruiting processes which very openly scan for certain top schools or previous impressive work experience, which are both primarily correlated with socioeconomic background. Right. So that's really the what's driving the 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 poor hiring outcomes we see. If we look across the economy, more than half of hires fail, and you can really point back to the resume as being the the primary culprit for uh, for that phenomenon. That's pretty um, incredible, Angela. And a lot of this came out of your work at Harvard Law School, at your work with the White House. What are you worried about as a lot of this hiring starts to go online instead? You know, I actually think it's an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, obviously with COVID-19, uh, millions of talented people have lost their jobs in the single largest unemployment drop in history. Um, but I've been saying to you know everyone, I've been saying for years that this is actually a unique, unique opportunity. Um, one of my more controversial opinions is that I actually think most people are in the wrong jobs. And this is a conclusion born out of those years of research because as job seekers, we're only ever directly exposed to such a small fraction of the possible jobs in the world, largely as a function of circumstantial factors like my socioeconomic background or um, you know, what jobs my parents did or you know, what's the hot job that came to campus when I graduated. Um, so it's very unlikely that people ever just serendipitously find the role that optimally matches their unique abilities and interests. So, you know, I actually believe this right. is this century's most imminent threat to American competitiveness. Right. So finding the roles that fit us is actually, you know, this is a, an opportunity for everyone mm -hmm. to kind of have a career pivot and find right. a role that, you know, really really fits their their ability their ability to compete in this workforce. Now, Angela, we want to come back to you uh, another time very soon on exactly how you're finding that skill set uh, matching with employers. Want to bring this back to Taylor for some breaking news. Yeah, thank you, Shanali. And with that breaking news, Etsy, Teradin and Catalint have all been added to the S&P 500. Tesla on this news, which we thought was going to be added, now falling 3% as they will not be added to the S&P 500. We're getting the press release from S&P Global Indices putting out this announcement, saying that these changes will be effective prior to the open of trading on Monday, September 21st. So again, Etsy, Teradyne, Catalint moving to the S&P 500. They're replacing H&R Block, Cody and Kohl's Core, all of which will move to the S&P mid-cap 400. Shares of Tesla falling now almost 4% post-market on that news. And I just want to uh, make sure that you guys all stay tuned with us because up next we are going to be discussing Slack's second quarter results. Can the company keep its momentum from June? We'll have that preview next. This is Bloomberg. Slack and Zoom have been two clear beneficiaries of the work from home trend during the coronavirus pandemic. While Zoom reported high earnings that crushed Wall Street estimates earlier this week, is Zoom going to be able to keep up the strong results from the last quarter? To get perspective, I want to bring in Nicholas Wences, Director of Equity Research at Aptopia, a provider of mobile app insights. Nicholas, great to have you. I think the issue and some of the concerns is the expectations are just so sky high for this company. Can they meet those expectations? Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here. Um, that's a great point. As we know, the entire space has been impacted by COVID in a positive way. Um, some valuations have been, you know, going up, as you mentioned. Um, Slack and Zoom together are both are two examples of that. Uh, Zooms may be justified given they're, they just reported uh, amazing numbers, so, so that's great. Uh, Slack, on the other hand, as you know, reports on Tuesday. And what we're seeing with our mobile app intelligence is super interesting because um, unlike the main competitors and players in the space, Slack's downloads are actually down 16% quarter on quarter, and they're also negative year on year. Uh, why that's important is because we've actually found a very strong correlation between downloads estimates and Slack's reported net new paid customers. So um, given that relationship, the negative 16% growth quarter on quarter points towards slowing uh, or deteriorating uh, net new paid customers going into the quarter. Uh, to put things into perspective, if you look at a Zoom, which just reported, their downloads were up 2,500% year on year. 
uh, in three three times quarter on quarter. And, and Microsoft Teams was up as well, I think 50% in the quarter year on year. So when looking at the general competition in, in market environment, Slack seems to be lagging peers uh, and losing market share. I'm curious about the demand that you see for Slack. If it was just pull forward from future quarters or if there still will be demand in several quarters out, even if things return to normal. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I, I think one of the main issues here is that Slack was widely used by companies before COVID, mainly for messaging purposes. When you look at um, the post-COVID world, companies' demand for video conferencing skyrocketed. So Zoom is clearly the, the main beneficiary here. Um, so we did see one month of, of strong downloads growth in March, where, where uh, Slack downloads grew by 30% year over year. However, that was followed by negative growth each month mm. since then and negative engagement growth, which, which indicates that the company is not, um, not retaining their new users. Um, you will see seasonal trends. So typically the holiday season, December, and now that um, you know, vacations are over in the summertime, we are seeing a pickup in Slack engagement and downloads uh, just in, in the month of September alone. However, going forward, I, I don't see anything that would change the declining growth year over year pre-coronavirus. Because if you, you got to keep in mind, Slack's engagement and downloads growth was actually deteriorating. It was negative growth before coronavirus even happened. Mm. So then you had one month of a spike in engagement and downloads, and since then it's been negative as well. So, so to be honest with you, I, I don't think that's the case. How much of that, that download engagement that you're watching is due to competitors. I mean, we talk about Microsoft's Teams product and Slack has been great, but they have huge competition. For sure. Um, there's actually some, some lawsuit going on right now between Slack and Microsoft, I believe. Uh, Slack is, is accusing Microsoft of anti-competition, uh, given the fact they're, they're issuing their, their Teams platform for free. Um, in order to retain kind of the Microsoft suite and Microsoft Office uh, products. So given the fact that Slack cannot afford to have a free, um, well, they, they do have a free platform, but they also have a paid, paid platform, um, I think the fact that Teams is free is really going to hinder Slack's performance going forward. Yeah, Nicholas Wences, Director of Equity Research at Aptopia, thank you. We are getting a conference from President Trump. Let's listen in. So as we begin Labor Day weekend, America's unprecedented economic recovery continues. You see what's going on. It's been pretty amazing. The United States economy added today, announced this morning, 1.4 million jobs last month, bringing the total to over 10.6 million jobs created in just four months. That's a record by far. In August, we added 249,000 retail jobs. 174,000 leisure and hospitality jobs, and 29,000 new manufacturing jobs. The unemployment rate plummeted to 8.4 percent, the second largest single month drop ever recorded, surpassed only by our big decline in June. Last month, we saw large declines in the unemployment rate for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans, very big declines. We're witnessing the fastest labor market recovery from any economic crisis in history, by far. By contrast, the last administration had the slowest, weakest, and worst recovery in American history. That was well documented, as you know. This year, the United States has seen the smallest economic contraction of any major Western nation, and we are recovering at a much faster rate than any other nation. Business confidence is higher today in America than in any other G7 or EU country. That covers a lot of territory, so we have the business confidence is higher than many in any of those countries. In July, retail sales not only recovered, but reached a new all-time high. So think of that. Retail sales, that's a very basic statistic, and it's a big statistic. It not only recovered, but reached the highest level ever. Auto sales have surged to an incredible 74 percent since their April low and are nearly back to their pre-virus levels. And that's been a tremendous thing. Used cars and new cars have been both doing incredibly well. Mortgage applications were 27 percent higher in August. 
than during the same period last year. Homebuilder sentiment reached the highest level on record, indicating that more high-paying construction jobs are on the way. Home building has been great, and lending has been really incredible. U.S. manufacturing activity reached a 19-month high in August. While my administration has fought every day to restore prosperity, however, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats in Congress are holding additional China virus relief hostage to uh, to reasons that nobody understands. I guess I do. I think I understand. It's called politics. And speaking of politics, I think uh, North Carolina, I think that Michigan and Pennsylvania and other states, they should open the governors, the Democrat governors should open the states. They'll open them on November 4th, but they should open them now. It's very unfair to the people to have those shutdowns continuing at the level that they're continuing. Democrats are insisting on a massive taxpayer bailout of badly run blue states, stimulus checks for illegal aliens, and the mass release of inmates from jail. They want to release a lot of inmates, some of them for very serious reasons. They want to release them from jail. They want that part as part of a stimulus package. Can you believe it? It's time for the Democrats in Congress to start working across the aisle and put the American people first. Now, we have $300 billion in a, an account that we didn't use, $300 billion, and we are willing to use that. I would be willing to release it, subject to Congress, and use that as stimulus money, and it would go right to the American people. So we have $300 billion sitting in an account that we didn't need because things are going so well with the economy. But it would be a very appropriate thing to release that to the American people, and I am willing to do it. All we need is a sign-off. But that doesn't mean that we're going to release prisoners, some prisoners, some very vicious people, actually. We're not going to put them on the streets like the Democrats want us to. And we're not going to give stimulus checks to illegal aliens. They came into the country eagerly, and now we give them a check. We want to give the checks to the American people. So remember, we have $300 million. It's there. We don't need the money. We don't need anything. Just let that money get released to the American people. As our economy rebounds, there's only one thing that could stop the extraordinary economic comeback and wipe out the future of American workers, and that's what the Democrats want to do with a $4 trillion tax hike, uh, implementing uh, things that will be really bad for our country. And this will uh, just absolutely cripple what we're doing on regulations and so many other uh, elements of success. We had the greatest economy in history prior to the China virus coming in. Now they want to uh, stop regulations. They want to uh, bring up regulations to a level, stop the things that we're doing, which are at a much smaller level, and bring up regulations at a level that nobody's ever seen before. They want to do things that will make it impossible for any economy to grow. They want to ban fracking. And as you saw, ban, 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 and all of a sudden, he sees his polls going down. And now he says, well, I was only talking about not maybe banning fracking, but he wants to ban fracking. And it doesn't matter what he wants to ban. The people that control him want to ban fracking. And whether it's Pennsylvania, Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, so many other states, you can't ban fracking. That would be a disaster. Ohio want to abolish American energy. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Adopt disastrous trade deals and inflict a devastating shutdown. Uh, as you know, he said, we want to shut it down. We would be willing to shut it down. And you don't shut down when we're setting records. And by the way, we're rounding the corner. We're rounding the corner on the virus. Joe Biden's blanket shutdown would collapse our economy, would cause countless deaths from suicide, drug, alcohol abuse, heart disease, and more. You know, shutdowns cause a lot of problems, a lot of very serious problems, more so than the virus itself. Biden's plan is not a solution. It's a virtual surrender. And our country is doing so well. We're starting to do so well. I think we're going to have a great third quarter. I mean, you're going to see for yourself, because the numbers will be announced sometime prior to the election on November 3rd. And as you know, Joe spent his entire career sending American jobs to China and other far 
faraway countries. For 47 years, people were pillaging our country, taking our jobs, taking our companies. And that's never going to change with that mindset and with that group. Uh, Biden is not going to be standing up to these foreign countries. He's not going to be standing up, maybe more importantly, to the people that run the Democrat Party. He doesn't have the strength to do that. He refuses even to condemn Antifa, a bad group, a far-left domestic terrorist organization. He doesn't want to say anything bad about it. His plan to appease the domestic terrorists is the exact opposite of what I'm doing. And I think you saw that last night. Yesterday, the U.S. Marshals, we sent them in, U.S. Marshals. Uh, we were waiting for local government to take care of it. But they didn't do that, so the U.S. Marshals went in, law enforcement. They took down the Antifa member who murdered a man in the middle of a street in Portland. The suspect was killed after drawing a weapon when officers attempted to take him into custody. They wanted to take him in the U.S. Marshals. Credible people. So I want to thank them for their strength, their bravery. And I really do wish that the mayor of Portland and the governor of Oregon would get going and stop the crime in that city. It'd be so easy to do. Well, we're focused on creating good-paying jobs. The radical left is focused on unleashing by really violent mobs. And you see that whether you're conservative, a liberal, Republican, Democrat, or independent, we must all agree the need for peace and order and safety. Under my administration, law enforcement is conducting arrests nationwide of rioters, looters, and domestic terrorists. The reasons we didn't put Chicago into our list where we're holding back funds from some of these states and cities that are doing such a poor job, such an incompetent job, uh, a job that nobody can even imagine how bad. And we're holding it back until they get their act together. And we are having a lot of people in Chicago right now. And you notice that their numbers are going down rapidly. But we have we've deployed a lot of federal law enforcement. You have been listening there to President Trump, who's giving a press conference. Of course, if we get to a Q&A session, we'll continue to bring you some headlines. Some of the headlines that stuck out to us here at Bloomberg is that the Trump saying that the government has $300 billion in an unused account that could be released. Of course, as Congress still awaits a deal on that further stimulus package. Uh, continuing to talk again about the Straub jobs report that we got this morning, saying that U.S. business confidence in the U.S. is higher than any other G7 territory. So talking about the economy, uh, talking about um, uh, 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 Joe Biden, and then continuing to talk about some of the protests that we've seen in other cities. Again, we'll bring you those headlines as we get them. In the meantime, several universities across the U.S., from New York to Philadelphia and Colorado, have been forced to send some students home this week due to raging COVID-19 outbreaks on campus. Schools are saying that parties and students not following social guidelines are to blame. And speaking of schools, we want to alert you here to a special series on Bloomberg Technology all of next week. We're going to be discussing education and technology with people who all have a stake in the new normal when it comes to learning. From software developers to educational leaders, you will want to tune in to Bloomberg Technology, the virtual classroom from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern after Labor Day week. And as far as the coronavirus itself, this coming season is renewing concerns about the country's abilities to contain it as colder weather approaches. Dr. Andrew Pekosh, professor and virologist of Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, joined Bloomberg's Tom Keen and Francine Lacroix earlier today. Practically speaking, six feet appears to be a number that most people are quite familiar with. And I think all the data suggests that, you know, if you maintain that along with the mask, you've got at least two things in place that will help prevent transmission. Um, so I think that's the simplest thing to try to get across to people as, uh, as an effective means of practicing this physical distancing between each other. We're going into a colder season. The 90 degree temperatures in New York City are breaking and you know, things get a little chill. What is the chart of temperature and virus? Where's the break point on that in Fahrenheit, or if you insist, do it in Celsius for Francine? Yeah, so, you know, it differs for each virus. Um, 
but it's been very clear that with with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, you know, we've had a lot of spread of that virus uh, in the U.S. under conditions like you just described um, that are extremely hot and humid. Um, with viruses such as influenza, we expect a seasonal uh, seasonality of that, and there is data suggesting that cooler temperatures and lower humidity helps transmission. Uh, we think some of those things are also true for COVID-19, but the reality is so many of us are uh, susceptible to infection that even under less than ideal transmission conditions, the virus sees enough susceptible people that it can maintain these transmission cycles, cause disease, and spread in the community. Um, Dr. Pekosh, how much do we know about long haulers, right? So th there's a lot of apps. The media is getting, you know, I guess wiser and starting to look into this. I mean, once you've had COVID, is that it? Or are there a significant number of people that then have to live with legacy or repercussions, whatever you want to call them, for three, four, five months or even longer? Absolutely. And this is, again, something that you... That, that you only start to realize as you move into a pandemic. You see that many people are suffering two weeks, four weeks, even longer than that from effects um, uh, of, of the virus infection. Um, a new, uh, uh, an important other aspect that's coming together is aspects uh, that, of how the virus infection can affect your heart. And there's certainly now more and more evidence suggesting that there are long-term damage to other organs that Maybe be a result of direct infection, but may also be simply a result of the immune response that this virus generates as it's working its way through your lung. So certainly we have to think about this disease as more than just a virus that can cause death in a certain percent of the population. It causes severe disease um, in relatively healthy people at a good percent, and it can cause these long-term effects in relatively healthy people. So we need a more holistic view of the true impact of this virus on health in general and on public health. If we have a flu shot for all the other flus, why can't we have a flu shot for this terrible virus? I think we're in the middle of trying to work out exactly what it takes to do that. There's been some fantastic work um, that's been done at very fast rates to try to generate vaccines. And we know that those vaccines can induce certain immune responses. Our big question, though, is are those immune responses that the vaccine's inducing, are those enough to protect you from infection? And importantly, are they enough to protect you from infection in a way that's gonna prevent you from even spreading the virus? Because it's possible that a vaccine could protect you from disease, but still allow you to spread the virus. So that's where the phase three trials that are undergoing now with vaccines are gonna be very, very critical because they're not just gonna look at safety. They're not just gonna look at are you inducing antibodies to the vaccine? They're going to look at protection. Are people that get the vaccine less likely to get COVID-19 than a control group that has gotten a placebo? And that's something that uh, we need to wait for those results to come through before we really invest in a widespread vaccination campaign, because we want to make sure that the virus, that the vaccine is efficacious and not just able to induce some immune responses and, and, and providing an unclear amount of protection. That was, John's, that was Johns Hopkins School of Public Health professor Andrew Peckish. And a reminder that the school is supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, the founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. And still ahead, lights, camera, action. Christopher Nolan's Tenet hits U.S. theaters this weekend, the first Hollywood release since COVID-19 shuttered cinemas in March. What it means for the industry, all of that next. This is Bloomberg. The NBA playoffs continue with the Milwaukee Bucks taking on the Miami Heat tonight, just about an hour's time. Later at 9 p.m. Eastern, Houston Rockets will be playing the L.A. Lakers. Now, Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban says a lot of credit can be given to the NBA over the league's ability to play games amid COVID-19 pandemic. He says he's stunned at how well the bubble has worked. Cuban sat down with David Rubenstein recently and talked about his ambitions for the Mavericks as well as investment opportunities. Take a listen. So as you uh, are talking to us today, you, you have many different businesses, but you have a big investment business and you've said 
publicly that you're a gigantic investor in Amazon and Netflix and other companies. And do you just have advisors that help advise you on these or you just make your own decisions? Pretty much make my own decisions. Yeah, I mean, I used to trade, as I mentioned, um, I used to trade a lot. I used to be very, very active as a trader. And, you know, back, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot less money chasing more stocks. And now there's a lot more money chasing fewer stocks. So um, it's harder to trade and, and be successful. So I just stick to the companies I believe in. You know, I've owned Netflix since it was 50 and, and Amazon, I was buying between 500 and 700 and actually bought some more in the high thousands, just under 2000. Um, but, and I've got some scattered things, you know, beyond that, that I've owned over the years that I've held on to. But I, I, I don't, I no longer trade you know, that Fed put is strong, that, that you know, that Fed um, inflation of financial assets kind of gives us a tailwind. Now, COVID, you have said, has changed the world in terms of opportunities. Uh, it's obviously hurt people, but it's obviously helped people who are entrepreneurial. So you've said this is a good time to actually figure out new businesses, new areas of business. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, you know, it, it's so unfortunate, but it's true. I mean, you know, we've heard Warren Buffett say, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets. And it's almost analogous here. So many small businesses are closing. So many, you know, retail stores are closing. Malls are, are you know, going bankrupt. Um, companies that are unable to transition to, to selling digitally or, or really taking a full advantage of e-commerce are struggling. Big companies don't understand, don't really aren't sure about how to protect their legacy businesses. That type of uncertainty creates a lot of opportunity. And combine that with people becoming far more comfortable with purchasing online and, and living a digital lifestyle, I think there's a lot of unique opportunities that are available to people who, who, who are creative, who have a vision for the future. I think you know, 10, 15, 20 years, we'll look back and there'll be 10, 20, 30 world-class companies that were created by people who we probably think are thinking are crazy right about now. Mark Cuban speaking earlier with David Rubenstein. Now, it's the Friday before Labor Day. Muvi executives will be on the edge of their seats this weekend just to see how many people will actually show up to theaters for Christopher Nolan's Tenet. The much delayed thriller is the first Hollywood blockbuster to hit U.S. theaters since March. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. Lucas, am I going to the theater to see Tenet or am I staying at home to see Mulan? <laughs> Uh, I think if you want to stay safe, you're probably staying home to, to watch Mulan. Of the two, I have only seen Mulan, so I can't speak to the quality of the two of them. Uh, but the, it, it looks like people feel a lot more comfortable still watching movies at home than going to the theater, at least in the U.S. The box office returns for Tenet outside of the U.S. have been pretty strong, but that's mostly in countries that have a much better handle on the coronavirus than we do. Are subscribers willing to pay 20, 30, what be it, to sit at home if we're missing out on the surround sound of a theater experience? Subscribers are willing to do it for the right movie. I don't know that Mulan is that movie. Um, it's, you know, we'll see what the response is in, in the first weekend. There's been some confusion about, do you need Disney Plus in order to watch it? If you buy it, where do you buy it? How long is it going to be there? Because also remember that Mulan will be available for free on Disney Plus, or not for free, but to Disney Plus subscribers in about 90 days. So I think you'll see a lot of parents decide hey, you know, maybe I'll just wait for this to come out and I don't have to spend the $30. But I do certainly think that there are movies that parents will pay for in that way. You know, we had one of these examples earlier this year with Trolls, which was a movie that Universal had planned to release in theaters. It shifted it to the, what's called the prim, premium video on demand window. And it did well enough that it encouraged Universal to strike a deal with some of the major theater chains to be able to do that for all of its movies. Lucas, in the minute that we have left, how nervous are some of these movie theater chains if we can just go direct to consumer and bypass that? Is this the beginning of a bigger shift? They're, they're very nervous, which is why you saw AMC, the biggest chain in the U.S., make a deal with Universal. If they're going to allow studios or studios are going to try to bypass theaters or at least shorten that window, as it's known, between when it's in theaters and at home, the theaters are going to want to cut of it. But I do think it's we're not going to see the biggest movies bypass theaters because there's just way more money to be made in the theaters. 
Yeah, thank you. There is always Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw. I'll let you know what my decision is. <laughs> now, every single IMAX theater is playing tenant this weekend, but even with the reopening of movie theaters in the U.S., capacity has been only about 50%. Bloomberg caught up with IMAX CEO Rich Gelfond, who shared his perspective on how audience behavior has changed. The takeaway is that where it's safe to open, people want to go to the theater and they seem to be coming not just one time, but they seem to be changing their behavior a little bit and not all coming on Saturday nights and Friday nights, spreading out a little bit. What's the biggest drag right now, Rich, in your mind as to what is kind of delaying the, um, the, the movie theatre story? Um, is it the lack of customers or is it the lack of movies to go and see? I think it's a little bit, um, I'll get back to specifically what you're saying, but I think it has more to do with people adjusting. So there have been other kind of epidemics, not of this scale before, and the behavior pattern is usually, they come back to some extent, but it takes a little while until it comes back fully. And when you said impediment, I think people are really coming now, but it's gonna take a little time to come back at full capacity mm. based on what we've seen historically. But right now, it's almost a question of who will go first. Will the theaters open first or will the films open first? And there was kind of a stalemate where both were afraid to make the first move. And one thing um, that Warner Brothers and Tenet did, which was really intelligent, was instead of the traditional pattern where you'd wait for the whole world to be safe and then you'd open the world day and day, they said, wait a minute, there may never be a time that it all works perfectly. So let's do a rolling global opening and let's open where it's safe and continue to roll through the world in doing that. And right now that seems to be working and the hope is that that gives comfort to some of the other studios and the other films and they open in a similar manner. So, so does that mean, Rich, that you don't expect 100%, well, I guess when do you expect 100% capacity to return? Yeah, so right now capacity is around 50% in most markets in China, it had been 25, and then it went up to 50, and now there are rumblings about it maybe going up more. In Canada, it was only 50 people a theater, which is one reason the IMAX numbers are so um, amazing, which is we did almost 10% of the global box office in this highly capacity-constrained way. But I think people are going to put their toe in the water, and they're going to see how it goes. And it's a little bit ironic because there have been no cases in the world, even though a lot of theaters have been open for a number of months, where with contact tracing, it's been traced back to a theater. But I think the governments want to just be certain. And there are a lot of safety protocols in place now, wearing masks, special cleaning, as you say, capacity limitations. And I think you'll see those open up. So um, this weekend, Tenant opens in China. And I think a lot of people are focused on the U.S., but I think China is going to be a very strong market. Um, Nolan, IMAX, and, um, um, and, and, and blockbusters all go well there. And I think, as I said, they're starting to think about more capacity open. So I don't think there's going to be a formula. I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis as the regulators feel comfortable. Rich, what's the shelf life of a movie? Let's take, for example, the new Bond movie. How long can you leave that on the shelf and expect it to deliver decent returns further down the road? Is there a point at which you've just got to get it out there? So that's a great question in terms of the pandemic now. So typically, the shelf life for IMAX is two or three weeks and then you move on. And in regular theaters, it's actually a shorter big play, but a longer tail up to a couple months. But during the pandemic, because of the capacity restrictions, what we're starting to see the beginning of is not everybody has to go the first Saturday night hmm. or the first Friday night. And millennials may feel comfortable going to the theaters and you know with more of their friends and more people there on Saturday night. But other people might say, you know, I'd rather go Wednesday morning. So um, we think the legs are going to be longer. Um, Chris Nolan movies always have long lives, um, historically. But for all movies, we think because human behavior will be different, 
people won't be back at work, some people won't be back at school. So you don't have to wait till Friday or Saturday night. So I think you're going to see during this period a longer um, legs. But I think, again, when it gets back to normal, whenever that is, it'll probably go back to the historic norm. That was IMAX CEO Rich Gelfand speaking with Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Guy Johnson earlier. I want to recap again some of the headlines that we were getting from the President Trump's a press conference, of which you're still looking at live photos of now. Some headlines that we were, we were getting in the last hour, continuing to talk about the big jobs report, adding 1.4 million, unemployment rate falling to a lower than expected 8.4%. Highlighting black, Hispanic, and Asian employment also dropping in business confidence in the U.S., um, certainly higher than any other G7 territory. Those are some of the president's claims. I also want to switch to some action that we're seeing in the post market with regards to these markets. S&P Global Indices saying that Etsy, Teradyne, Catalint all being added to the S&P 500 effective Monday, September 21st. Tesla was falling post-market because at least for now, it will not be included in the S&P 500. So very interesting to see a shift in a shakeup of that indice. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure to stay tuned for Wall Street Week. David Weston, he's going to be speaking with Jillian Tett of the Financial Times, Invesco's Christina Hooper, and former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. Thank you for joining us and have a great Labor Day weekend. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.